So imagine this, you've got your sketchbook or you're out painting and you see like animals and you don't know how to deal with them. Lon Brower, what are you going to do for us today? Well, I'm going to see if I can uh, simplify the whole process. You know, we, we all run into that where we, you know, we, we're driving down the road and we see some cows or some horses you know, out in the field and we think we, we want to do that field, but we want to put those animals in there. But you all know that, you know, as soon as you pull everything out of the car and you set it up, well, the horses are long gone. And if there's cows, they'll, they'll, they're a little bit more uh, forgiving and they will, they'll hang around until you get completely set up and you put paint on your brush. And then they'll turn around and they'll look out over their shoulder and they'll say, see ya. And so what do we do with that? Uh, and, and anybody who's had that experience, we know we still want to put the cows in there. We've seen cows. We know what cows and we know what horses look like. We know what chickens look like. We know what goats look like. But how do we how can we find some way, some symbolism that we can use to uh, uh, construct these things and put them in there from memory? I mean, let's okay, face so it. what we're going to do is we're going to come right back and then you can dive into detail and we're going to learn how, an easy way to do animals in your yeah. in your drawings or paintings. All right, we'll be right back. It's art school. Whoops. It's art school live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host. Eric Rose. Welcome to Art School Live. We are here uh, seven days a week and essentially, uh, I, did I say seven days a week, five days a week at 12 noon? Hello, starting off the week right. And we are live today and we hope that you will join us in the comments. As a matter of fact, we have prizes for comments I'll tell you about in a second. Our guest today is Lon Brower. Lon is a fabulous artist, uh, makes his living as an artist. You're going to learn a lot from him about how to paint cows and chickens and horses, maybe even some people real quickly or how to draw them real quickly so you can get them into your, into your paintings. Uh, so that's going to be pretty cool. Lon is an incredible artist, and what I love about him is that he's very free, very abstract, and these are some animals and things that he's doing, so you're going to get a chance to understand uh, how to get these things down fast. Now, I mentioned prizes. If you put a comment in the comments section today, and if you've never won a pair of value specs, they're so cool. I mean, you know, they're a fashion statement, but really they help you see your darks and lights so that you can really make sure your values are spot on. Because what do they say? Values do all the work and uh, uh, color gets all the credit. So if you get your values down, this will help you. Uh, the winner of the last prize is Joanne Glim Glimmer in Tucson, Arizona. We have a gift for you today. Uh, it is a video, five hours of video, 50 top artists, and you can get yours for free at 97artsecrets.com. You can get it digitally, or if you want the actual physical DVD, uh, yes, we still provide those if you want them. Uh, this one, if you pay the postage, that would be really cool. All right. Uh, and, of course, you can subscribe to this program on YouTube or follow on Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera. Uh, if you go to YouTube and uh, subscribe, that would be cool because we're trying to get over that 100,000 mark, and we're just, like, on the edge. Got a couple thousand more to go. And that'd be cool. And follow me at Eric Rhodes. Okay, now let's get back to Lon Brower. Bra Lon, here we go. Uh, we're in. Uh, let's see. Let's go. There we are. Good. Okay. Now I can see myself. Fantastic. Uh, let me know if you can't hear anything, but uh, uh, it sounds good. I think it sounds good. Sounds um, good. What I want to do is, uh, you know, I, I kind of have a plan on what I want to do today. Um, and it may get to be a little bit more too complex for beginners. So if, uh, if that happens, let me know, Eric, and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can take it down a notch. Uh, I know that one of the things that happens with a lot of us artists, uh, you know, the working artists, we know things that we that beginners don't, and we forget that there is a big gap between what we know and what they know. So, uh, you know, oh, I'll, whip you, I'll whip you into shape. You have no, no, oh, I appreciate there. that. You know, the whole purpose of this is to get everybody to, to at least, you know, find some little nugget that they can, uh, uh, use and, and you know when they go out in the field. So, uh, and this is kind of coming from my own experience. Um, uh, you know, when I started doing plein air. 
I did like everybody. I just painted vistas. And then, of course, you start adding things. You start adding horse, you know, you start adding houses or buildings and then you start doing trees. And, and every time I go out, what I'm looking for is uh, not just something to paint, but I'm looking to find out what I don't know. Uh, you know, I know how to paint a tree, but do I know certain, you know, specific details of how to paint a tree? Uh, maybe a better example would be uh, 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 surf on a beach. Uh, we can see it. You can sit there and watch it all day long, but that doesn't mean that just because you have any, a memory of seeing it that you're going to be able to construct. It. That's a whole different, uh, uh, you know, that's a different animal. So. Uh, what I do is I use this time of year, uh, you know, on the off season, I'm not crazy about going out and painting in the cold. I, it's just not my thing. And uh, so I'll use this time in studio to figure out how, what, you know, how are these things structured? How can I paint them? Uh, you know, if I wanted to do sunsets and sunrises, which I do occasionally, uh, you know, that's, that's a prime example. If anybody's tried to do a sunset or a sunrise, you can't just go out there and watch it and then make it happen. You have to take bring some memory knowledge with you. And, uh, you know, the same thing uh, I find um, applies to if you want to put uh, farm animals into a into a landscape. He says, you know, if you, you know, you, 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 you know, you set up your stuff, the cows are not going to stay there. They're going to wander off. Uh, and horses, they don't care anything about it about painters and they'll just wander off and you they'll be gone long before you've even put the brush to the canvas so uh so what do you do with that you have to find some sort of uh uh symbol uh and it, it you know, that's what painting is it's all about making symbols uh whether you know no matter how realistic you do it you know even the the, the folks who come out of the uh, the academies when they're um you know they're doing these photorealistic you know highly rendered uh figures or animals or, or or you know casts or whatever they're doing uh even those everything that they put on to a flat surface with a pencil or a charcoal is you know it's it's a symbol it's all symbolism so well, you've got to it let's see some symbols baby all right let's do it all right well one one of the things that uh now what i'm going to do is i've got a panel here and i'm going to be putting things on and wiping things off so we're not really going to get an end result uh so it's it might be one of those things that you want to try to put it in your head because we're going to move on to other things so you're going to be uh, drawing with paint i'm going to be drawing with paint what i've done is i've mixed up i've just got some basic size brushes i got a three quarter inch brush i got a two inch brush and i've got a, a quarter inch brush that i pulled out of a box so um just so i can draw with it and i mixed up some uh ivory black and some uh cad red uh i've been teaching some workshops on the zorn palette which you know is black and white and cad red and yellow ochre and so and, I, and one of the combinations i really like is that black and red it's kind of a purple uh so it's gonna i think it'll work it's very monochromatic uh so we're really not talking about color today this is going to be about more about form so uh you know, one of the things that, you know, when we were kids, uh, we were five years old, we could draw a horse and we didn't have a problem with it. it. You know, we, as everybody knows, this is what a horse looks like. It's a four legged animal. Kind of looks like a helicopter to me. Does it? <laughs> you haven't been drawing horses, have you? <laughs> I just put a so, blade on it. Anyway, we, you know, but but our but when we get to second, by the time we get to second grade and we're eight years old, we say, no, that's not going to cut it. So we start looking. What we do anytime when we're learning to draw, we typically and may not be aware of it, but we are looking at outlines. We look at contours. And, uh, uh, you know, so we think, okay, so a horse has a contour. And I'm just going to do this, and I'm not. This is not going to be real accurate, but you get the idea. Now we might embellish it more than that, but that's what's going on in our head. We see that. We see shapes. Uh, if you were, if you had a, a group of horses in a field, and you really wanted to get a better representation, uh, one way to do that is take a photograph and paint for the photograph. Uh, in fact, that's a great way to uh, do some study. Uh, 
you know, if you're in studio and take those photographs and paint from those photographs. And what's happening, though, is that contour, you can study that contour and you can see, you know, where the withers is and you can see how it relates to a to a leg. But in the but in if this this animal is out in the field moving around, you have no way of the contours are going to be changing constantly. Uh, we've got an, an example of uh, several years ago, I was down in uh, Texas at a ranch and I was painting and they had a longhorn steer. And I know cows pretty well. And I thought this is just a big cow with long horns. And uh, it, uh, I could get the body on it. And I got the body, I nailed it, but the head I could not figure out. And I'm trying to, as that, hit, that, that steer is moving its head around, those horns are going, they're going, you know, they're going this way, then they're going this way, then they're going this way. I couldn't figure it out. It was just like it had, uh, you know, it was like it was, uh, you know, like a, a spiral staircase, two spiral staircases going in opposite directions. Uh, and that was a case where I thought, okay, you know what? I spent three hours on this, went through two rolls of paper towels. I need to go back in studio and figure out how this thing is actually structured. So, and that comes, I run into that all the time. And one of the things that I do that I like, it's, I think people don't realize is that we're raising questions all, you know, painting is all about raising questions and, and, uh, and finding out what the problem is and then trying to find an answer for that question. And uh, I'm always asking myself, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, have a chicken. I've painted this shape many, many times. The chicken and you've got a foot coming down. What does what happens on that foot? Well, you can put grass in there and you can cover it up and you don't have to worry with it. But my question is always. I need to know what that foot looks like. You know, you can you can kind of do this and your guess, but it's not. You're not answering the question. So you know, it's 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 it. I like to think of it as sort of a lifelong uh, pursuit of finding out what does a chicken leg do, um, and what it actually does is the chicken has three toes, and it has a fourth one on the back. Does it have five legs? or it doesn't have five toes, it has three. So, and are they webbed? No, uh, but what has web legs, or has web feet? Seagulls, I do a lot of seagulls. Same foot, basically, but they're webbed. So you can, you know, it's just one of those things that you're, you're constantly should be asking yourself, what don't I know? And again, you can put grass over it and you can cover it up. But what I want to talk about a little bit today is uh, we're going to I'm going to take you back to eighth grade uh, biology class. And if you remember, we're uh, working, seeing how things are structured. All right. I want to know in the comments who actually dissected something in eighth grade and what was it or seventh grade? I dissected. A, <laughs> yeah, I dissected a frog. We dissected all kinds of things. And, you know, that, I mean, you and I are of the same generation where that's what they did. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think they need to. Well, but, that's, that's... Uh, yeah, you know, that was that was the mo mode of operating. Um, I want to do uh, just an example. Let's say you had uh, let's say you had a ladder back chair. Bear with me here. And then let's say that you put a blanket over it. It's obviously a clear blanket. It is a clear blanket. <laughs> let's take let's think of that chair as a skele a skeleton, okay? The skeleton on any mammal is going to tell you where what the contours are going to be and what this what i'm want to be talking about today is really kind of kind of just exposing everybody to understanding that uh that is part of it so if you didn't see the chair you just saw the blanket you might see that but you still would know that there must be something underneath it and it must be probably a chair and you can guess that it's a ladder back chair 
Do you need to know that it's a ladder back chair? No, but you do need to know where the blanket is being affected by the structure underneath. And there'll probably be something right here. Well, in the same way a horse, let's say, the skin on a horse is not just floating out there by itself. It is, it is draped over like a blanket over a skeleton. And I'm gonna show you how I structure, how I build uh, a horse. And I'm hoping that when I go through this, you'll see that it really isn't as complicated as you might think. Uh, in fact, well, this is coming from the experience. I've been struggling with painting cows and horses for a long time. In fact, during COVID, I, I have a friend who couldn't get out, of course, but I have a friend who has stables. And I went over to her place several times, you know, just to work on my horse anatomy. That's when I got into doing chickens because chickens were on their feet and they're a whole lot easier. They only have two legs. Uh, but it dawned on me that, you know, there's... It, it's it's not as complicated as as I, I I would even look at a horse or I would look at a cow and I'd say, well, it's just so complicated. How am I going to draw this thing? It's not that complicated. Um, you know, if you know, let's say let's do this first. Um, a simple symbol for a cow. If let's say it's in a well, let's do this first. Let's say you have. Say you have a landscape. Got some trees, you got a hillside, comes down like this. If it's a small painting, you can actually do this to indicate those cows. Now, you might want to need a little bit more than that. Well, you can say, well, let's just put some feet on them or some legs. And maybe you put a neck on it. And basically, what you're doing is you're doing a simplified cow. Cows are, cows are interesting because I always think of them like furniture. So what I, what I do, Lon, is... What do uh, you do? Uh, I try, if I'm putting a, a grouping of cows or sheep or something together, I uh, try to define one. One that's yes. going to be kind of closer to the, to the front of the scene so that they're going to assume if that, they can tell that's a sheep, they're going to assume the other white dots are sheep. That's exactly true. And that's because if you can give a little bit of information, uh, you can be loosey goosey. I mean, you can be really kind of vague about all the other animals. But if there's a group of them and one of them reads as a cow, they all read as cow. Uh, that's and that's a smart strategy. My friend Charles White always said a cow is a box with legs. It's that's ex that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, you can do this. And, you know, that. That's a cow, and it works. Uh, the thing of it is that when you, if you make that, if this becomes the feature in your in your uh, composition or a major player, even that's not going to be enough. Because where does this leg come out? Does this is this a front leg on the back, or is this a front leg on the you know on the on the back, and this was on the front? You know, you have to know a few things uh, because you can't take. Yeah, let's see here. You see this sometimes. People will put their, their their legs back here. Still reads, but it's not quite right. Uh, and sometimes, and I've done this myself, where I have, you know, I put the head really close. Let's do it this way. It's made of buffalo. You're just making a big mess. Stay with me. You can have with the cow. You put the you can put the head here, but you're guessing, uh, and it's sort of a generic uh, uh, animal. What I want to do is I want to talk about what is inside here. What actually causes these legs to be here? These back legs to be here. What causes this? Okay, so we're going to figure out the skeleton under the blanket. It's the skeleton under the blanket, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so bear with me here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we sometimes also don't realize is we carry a reference skeleton with us all the time, everywhere we go. It's I always have mine. Us. Yes, exactly. People, uh, I know plein air artists, a lot of times I'll talk to them and I'll say, you know, you need to, it would be very valuable for you to take a figure class. And they say, oh, no, 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 that's too complicated. I can't do that. 
Um, and it is a complex thing. However, it can be simplified. And I, again, talking in terms of symbols, whenever I start a figure, I always start with, with a rib cage. Now, this is internal stuff. So the only way you can actually find that this out and understand the shape of that is either through having a model, uh, you know, a, a model of a skeleton, an actual skeleton, which I have, uh, or you can work from uh, uh, drawings of anatomical drawings. But the shape of this thing is you find a symbol for, for a rib cage. Almost like an upside down heart. Exactly. And that's the way I kind of think of it. And to further that, if you have a spine comes down, there's a distance. Well, let's get, I'll get to that in a minute. The pelvis is also a heart shape going this way. That you can remember. It's much more complex than that, but that's simple enough that you can use. You're going to cover it up anyway. And one of the things that I always want to tell people is there's, you know, be aware that the distance between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis, it's only about four inches. You know, if you take your thumb and put it on the bottom of your rib cage and then put your finger on the top of your, your hip, you'll see that the distance is very quite, is really quite short. Once you have that, you know, you can actually, you, you know, if you come down, if you don't realize that, then you can get these kinds of, uh, distortions where you get too much distance in here. Not important at this point. But so I'm going to run this back here. Like so we have on the back of we we have short we know our shoulder blades. Actually I'm going to turn it I'm going to put a head on here. Let's do this. I'm going to we're looking at this figure now from the back. We have shoulder blades that look like wings. So somebody told me, gave me a tip one time on this show. Uh -huh. um, if you're looking, if you're creating a figure in a painting and you want it to look like it's from the back, don't show much neck. If you're looking at it from the oh, front, you show more, more neck. You know, a lot of people who want to throw, and watercolors do this all the time, and I paint with some watercolors. You know, you can paint a little figure. You know, you'll see them do this, you know, where they, or let's see, there's another, you know, you can find little, little notation, little shorthands for figures. That's one way to do it. And you can put that in, but if you want to take it a little further, you know, we, we, you have to know a little bit about what's underneath. And it's simple from here. You got upper arm, lower arm and a hand, upper arm, lower arm, which is two bones of radius and the ulna. And then you've got a hand, you got the and upper the leg. Elbows, by the way, I've noticed the elbows kind of right, go right to the edge of the rib cage. Right here. Yeah, they line up pretty much right here. Yeah. The leg and for measurement purposes, uh, the leg is typically three heads, one, two, three, and the arms are typically two heads. One, two. You with me on that? So that's a head high. And this is a head, you can get three heads in a, in a leg. You got the lower leg and then you got a foot. Lower leg and a foot. It's basically a stick figure. So the only parts we're gonna be dealing with is we're gonna be working with upper arms, lower arms, hands, upper leg, lower leg, feet. Um, Rib cage, pelvis, and head, and uh, on our shoulder blades. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this figure, I'm going to wipe him down, and just kind of make a mental note of him, and I'm going to put him in down on all fours. We don't travel on all fours, but animals do, but we are a four-legged animal. I'm going to put in the spine. Now from the side, our our rib cage has a, it's, our rib cage is squat. An animal's rib cage typically is more robust and uh, is elongated this way. In other words, the side is longer and it's shorter going in the depth. You know, from the, from the, from the top, our rib cage looks like this and an animal's rib cage 
is more ovoid in this way. So, now I know there's some of you out there thinking, well, okay, well, well, yeah, well, where are we going with this? Just stick with me. It's going to help. So, uh, the pelvis, again, the distance here and here is pretty close. From the side, it's, you, you, again, you have, if you look at drawing or at uh, uh, diagrams, you can find a shape that you can learn how to draw. The leg is going to come off here. This is the upper leg. This is the lower leg. And this is the foot. And our shoulder blades, are sit, they sit on top of our rib cage. These would be in the ribs. And the shoulder joint is right here. We have upper, upper arm, lower arm, and a hand. And our heads, unfortunately, we are not made to be like this. We're, we've gone a long ways from the monkey stage. And our spine comes out of the bottom of our skull. So we typically will look down when we're on all fours. And then once you have that structure in there, then you just have to cover it up with the blanket. Now you may not get the contrast exactly right, but you've got something to build it on. And that's the whole point of this discussion. And the muscles of the gluteus comes here, down the leg, and down the arm. Now, the reason I wanted to show you that is again, it's something we're familiar with because we carry it with us all the time. If we had a tail, if we had a tail, our spine comes down here, our tail actually ends, we do have a tail, the coccyx bone is right here. But if it was continued out, we'd have a tail like that. In our old, in the old ancestral days, that's what we had. So what I want to do is, I'm going to come up here. I'm going to build a horse. I'm going to build it based on this. And you'll see how it actually builds itself. So I'm going to start with the rib cage again. Well, first I'm going to start with, a, I'm going to put spine and spine on a horse is about like this. Now, how do I know that? Because I've looked it up. And I've practiced it. Uh, you know, it's any time we're painting something, you know, there, there's there's always this idea that, well, you just buy some paints and go out and paint things. Well, there is a certain amount of uh, knowledge that we need to gain as we go. If we want to if we want to move up the ladder in some way, uh, you know, we have to do there's study involved, just like anything else. If you were learning uh, to play an instrument. You have to study the instrument and, un and understand how to read music and that sort of thing. Uh, drawing and painting is the same way. Uh, it takes a certain little bit amount of uh, uh, energy and, and uh, uh, desire to get out there and actually find out some things. So anyway, the uh, spine on a horse has a little bit of a curve to it. And you're thinking, OK, no, the, the, the contour of a horse, it does this like that, it actually curves this way, not this way. Well, it actually does curve this way. The uh, vertebra, the reason it has this, this point right here, which is the withers, uh, there are these spines coming off of the, off the vertebra. And then there's also this, this, in the rump area, there's also a series here. So we're gonna put in the, the rib cage is about this shape. One of the things that I try to do is uh, I, I have a mantra that it doesn't have to be accurate. It just has to be believable. The more accurate it is, the more believable it is, of course. The, uh, now we're going to put in the pelvis. The pelvis of a, of a horse is shaped like, I, I like to think of it like a lazy L. And right here in the center of it, that's where the leg's going to attach. Now the uh, uh, the arm's going to attach to the scapula. Remember, I said that the scapula on the on the human is right here. It sits right on top of your back. Well, on a horse, it's a little different. It is this. It's shaped like like a wedge. Wipe that out just a little bit. 
The reason they call it a shoulder blade is because it is shaped like a blade. In fact, in the old olden times, they used to make plows out of horse, horse shoulder blades. Fascinating. Nice big flat bone. From that, then you have, we're going to do the upper arm, which is on the, uh, on the human. It's a, it also comes off, this is the shoulder of a horse. So you have, a, this is the humerus or the upper, upper, upper arm. And right here is the elbow. That's this elbow. There's a, there's a bone that sticks out here. It's called the acromion process. And it, uh, uh, what it does is it keeps, the, keeps your lower arm from, from extending back this way. It can only go this way. Uh, and a horse will have it too. And the thing that you can look at as far as where does this go? Does it go here? Does it go here? It lines up pretty much with a scapula. This, this, this direct, this angle right here is kind of an important angle. And most of us know it's there. We just don't know why it's there. I'll wipe that out just a little bit. Is the upper arm and the lower arm is going to come down here and to about this point. And what that is, that is the wrist. This is the wrist of the horse. We think of the leg on a horse as being, you know, it comes out, you know, the horse's body here and it comes out and we think that's the whole leg. And this is the, and this is, uh, this is where the foot is. The foot actually starts here. Uh, it's, you know, it's a evolutionary change. Uh, so when you have the upper arm, then you have the lower arm, it comes to here, which is the same as this in comparison. Then from here on down, this is foot. And these are the, the carpal, what are known as carpal bones. I'm going to wipe, I'm going to take his, take his tail out just for the moment. I want to get that leg in there. So from here, there's a bone here, there's a bone here, and then there's a hoof. A horse stands on one toe. We could do the same thing, but we have five toes or five fingers. We have five toes. When we get to the horse's uh, back leg, you'll see that it also stands on one toe. All right, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to draw him back in. We're going to draw this bone, which is this bone. It's a femur bone. We'll just call it the uh, upper leg bone. The, the, the upper, upper arm and the upper leg will kind of line up. So you can, that gives you some sort of reference. And also, usually this is going to line up about there with, with the uh, edge of the rib cage. Now, obviously, if I have the rib cage too big, then that's going to move it all back. But it'll, it'll, it'll still work out. And then you have the lower, the lower leg here. It's going to do the same, roughly the same angle. And then we're going to have the foot. Now the foot on a horse, here, we're going to do this too. I want to draw this line across here where the wrist is on the horse. This is wrist. Remember, this is the wrist, not the knee. This is the elbow. This is the wrist. And I'm going to draw a line across here just so I can find out where, where is this going to intersect with a foot bone. And you see this bone here that sticks up. There's a tendon that hooks to that. We have the same thing on our bodies, our heel bone. This is the heel bone on the horse. And then it has a bone here, which is basically, it's a tarsal bone, which is a foot bone. Then you have a toe, toe here. You with me so far? I'm with you so far. All right. Good deal. All right. Now, uh, let's get rid of whatever this was. All right, I'm going to show everybody. I've just put a picture of a horse skeleton on it. You can buy them online. An actual, an actual horse skeleton, only $15,000. I don't yes. know if you know the, the story about Dan Sprick, but he's... Yeah, he you know that dead. story? What? You know that story? Yeah, finding the dead horse and yeah. boiling yeah. it down and rebuilding a skeleton. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, 
yeah, if I ever find a dead horse, I'm doing exactly the same thing. But I'm into that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I could really appreciate that. Uh, let's uh, put in the neck, the next, the next neck part of the spine for this horse. We're just going to put it there because I'm running out of space. I'd actually like a little higher, but that's all right. Uh, all all uh, mammals have uh, a seven vertebra, cervical vertebra. That means from the head down to the shoulder. Uh, that's just that's just knowledge that you can use at a at a cocktail party. Um, humans have it. Giraffes have it. Doesn't matter the length of the neck. There's just going to be seven cervical uh, vertebra, except for three animals, and that's the manatee and the two-toed sloth and the three-toed sloth. Don't know why they're different, but they are. And uh, again, just information to take to a party. I'd never get invited um, back if I start talking about that stuff. <laughs> sometimes, you know. Well, maybe sometimes I'll get you out of a party. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, my my great line: if so, if I'm in a not in a mood to talk when I'm on an airplane, yeah, um, I will. Um, they'll say, "Well, what do you do for a living?" I'll say, "Well, I'm in insurance. Are you covered?" And they'll never say another word. <laughs> I'll keep that one in mind. So anyway, all right. So a, a couple things that I want to point out too, uh, and I'm not I'm not writing this down. You don't have to take notes. You don't have to. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a test. But just some things. This is a general thing to understand: is that a horse's body will actually fit, not not the neck and the head, but just from the shoulder at the at the at the farthest point. And the leg, let's say the end of the pelvis here, will fit in a square. And you can check yourself. If you, if you think your, your horse is too long or too short, you can check it by saying, okay, let's put, a, let's put a box around it and let's see. So I can measure that from the width. Okay, so that's my width. Yeah, maybe his legs are just a little too long. That's all right. It's not that far off. You know Tim Oliver, right? Yeah. He's a guy, a good yeah. buddy of mine that we paint together. He was, he was down in uh, San Angelo, Texas several years ago, and he was doing the quick paint. And, uh, you know, he's a watercolorist. And uh, he did this painting. I don't remember what was all in there, there, but there was a horse in there. And he, uh, he won a prize. But his horse was, it was a bit like this, if you can imagine. It was a little bit better, better horse than that, but, uh, but it was very long. And he said, Ma, my horse, I, you know, I was congratulating him. He said, yeah, my horse was too long. I said, well, the judge didn't care. He said, well, but I thought, you know, I said, I just said, you know, why don't you put a couple, another set of uh, legs in that horse and be a much better horse. But if he had put it into a box, he would have seen that. In fact, he could have just taken it and made, made, maybe make the legs longer. One of the things that uh, I used to joke about was if I'm drawing a, I'm drawing a, a horse in a field and it ends up looking like a goat, then I'll just say, well, that's a goat painting. So, you, you know, you're going through a lot of, you're putting the un, un, under uh, structure in first, but if you're out in the, the field and you're painting fast, do you go to all that trouble or do you just no, kind of know? Here's the no, shape. I, know. I'm gonna show you real, I can show you real quick what I do do. Uh, All right. I just, you, well, I'll tell you what, Lon, before you sure. show me real quick, why don't you prepare your canvas? I'm going to take a quick break and I'll have you back in a second. Sounds like a good idea. It is a good idea. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Eric uh, from Plein Air Magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur and others. And today at Art School Live, our guest is Lon Brower and he's showing you simplified ways to remember how to do a horse or a cow. Maybe he'll even... Well, he did a person. So uh, next up, he's going to go in and do it quickly so we can get a feel for it. Okay, just a couple of things. First off, uh, Lon is going to be teaching at the Plena Air Convention. He's going to actually be a field painter. He's going to be out there instructing people who are out there who need a little help because that's what we do. It's coming up the 21 through 25th. It's a great Christmas present or Han Hanukkah present for yourself. And uh, But you better get it because when the surprise celebrity guest is announced it's over there won't be any seats left uh also want to mention to you lon's got an incredible 
a video. It's a brand new video out. It's called Abstract Figure Painting, and uh, it's really, really wonderful. Hi, I'm Lon Brower. I'm a painter of both figure and plain air landscape, and I'm from Grand City, Illinois. In this video, you're going to see that something as complex as a figurative photo reference can be broken down into basic shapes. And once you can do that and you can see those, then transferring that to a, to a surface and making a painting is going to be a whole lot easier. You know, my approach to oil painting is this. I, uh, I'm very much about experimentation, and I'm also a, a very aggressive painter. Uh, I like to put paint on with big brushes and move it around. Uh, for me, paint is more important than subject. It's the paint and how the paint is interacting and moving around with brushes and other tools. In the end, we come up with a representational image. A couple things that I want, I'm hoping that you can pull away from this video. One is that painting is a journey, not a destination. And what I mean by that is the, the, the time that we spend making a painting is, is as important as the end result. In fact, I like to think of the end result as a byproduct, not an end product. So in other words, you paint, you paint, you paint, and at the end, if you're lucky, you'll get something you can put on the refrigerator. That's one thing. The second thing is, I think that we need to build memory. Painting is about building memory. So it's building experiences, and we put those experiences in our head as memory, and then we can take that and we can pull up things. So when we're, when we're working on, say, a figure painting, we can bring in all this other information that we've, brought, you know, we've, we've built over the years, how to drive a car, how to, how to bake an apple pie, all these kinds of things. You think, well, they're, they're way, uh, they have nothing to do with that. Yes, they do. It's all up here, and we're, we've got this casserole in our heads, and we, we need to keep adding things to it. And the more we add to it, the more we have to draw from when we make a painting. So we're going to make some paintings, and uh, we're going to be pushing a lot of stuff around, and we're going to take this journey together. I think you're going to enjoy it. I think you're going to learn a lot. I think it's going to really enhance what it is you know now. And like I said before, you're going to be putting stuff into the casserole and it's just going to get better and better and better. And if you were not able to scan that QR code very quickly, you can find that video uh, on painttube.tv where we have over 600 professionally produced art instruction videos. And when I say professionally produced, I mean, you know, Hollywood level uh, uh, editors and photographers and lighting and sound and, and and they do it right and um lon is is right there we also posted it in the comments for you okay back to lon brower we're learning about doing horses and people and we're going to do it quickly now lon take it away okay so what you, what you understand there's this this kind of thing going on once you understand that then when you're in the field you can block in a uh a um uh, rib cage, and you've got a you've got a uh, pelvis. You've got a leg here. You got a leg here. You got a leg here. You've got there's a you know the um, uh, shoulder blade here. You've got the, the upper arm, then you've got the lower arm. You've got a neck, and you've got this, and then you can build your horse pretty quickly. The other thing, whether well, that's not a very good one. Let's try another one. Put in that just as a flat shape. You're going to have the leg comes here. How, how's that showing? That's showing up all right. Yeah. Yeah. And your neck. And that. And it's also valuable. Let's say you take a horse and you say, what would it look like if it was on its back haunches? If you've ever looked at Frederick Remington paintings, you know, he'll often put, particularly in his, in his uh, uh, sculptures, you know, he'll have put a horse up on its hind legs. Well, you can do that fairly easy. Again, if you understand, start, always start with the rib cage. Pelvis, upper leg, lower leg, and the foot. And then you got the, the arm. And in this case, instead of coming down like this, you're going to put those, you're going to have that, this is the upper arm, this is the lower arm, and the hand. And then you got a horse. 
and then put the back leg in. It's going to do pretty much the same thing. So that's kind of how the you know how we want to apply this. Uh, you know, again, you know, it's simplified to simplify that even more. Uh, just take that that this this uh, diagram here. You can learn how to do it fairly quickly, and this is how I do it. You know, I'll put in that, and I know there's a pelvis here. It's upper leg, lower leg. So we come here. Uh, I need to know that that scapula is there, upper arm, and it comes down, and then the arms, uh, the uh, neck's going to come up here, and I'm going to put in, put in the head, and then you can fill in the contours. Now at this point, you can make chut, and then you can then you can actually then look if a horse happens to come back into the field or it comes close enough that you can. You can start looking and saying, okay, now that I've got a structure to build on, now I can look at this contour and see if there's a way for me to make it more uh, structurally sound. And that is coming because we know what is inside of it. That actually looks like a camel. <laughs> And that's all it takes. And actually, if you wanted to make it into a giraffe, this is where it gets fun. Giraffe. I don't know what a giraffe head looks like. It's kind of like a horse, but it's. I know it's not. It comes down. Its body is a little shorter. I know that. So we're going to leave this front arm, the front leg, front arm, front leg. We're going to put the pelvis here, which means that's going to move this leg forward a little bit. Let me get rid of this. And it's got, remember I was talking about these processes right here for the withers, which is the, the, the high point on a, on a horse's uh, back. Uh, I know that a giraffe has them too, but they're very, they're very big. That's why you get a giraffe looks like this. A giraffe is actually a horse. Everything is a horse. And you end up with a horse, with a, with a, a giraffe. And then without having really, I don't really know what a giraffe looks like, but I can pull one off. I don't know what the tail, I just assume it looks like this. So if someone says, again, you're at that same party where they say, you know, you, you're trying to impress people and you say, I know how to draw a giraffe. You can, All right. Yeah, so, make it. Okay. Now we're going to do a lightning round. I want you okay. to, erase, I want you to erase everything. 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 You got it. All right. Then we're going to do a lightning round. We're going to see how good you really are. We're going to test you. Make sure you put a chicken in there if you would. Everybody well, that, it'll seem, if I do that now, it's going to seem rigged. All right. Let me shoot. Okay. Now, this is up to the comments. The people in the comments, you got to tell me what, what you want Lon to do a quick drawing of. Okay. Uh, rhino. All right, a rhino. Again, we're going to start. We're going to start with. And I don't know what a rhino looks like. I mean, I know what it looks like, but I've never drawn one. We're going to start yeah, well, with. That's why we're doing this. I know. All right, so we're going to put there. A rhino is fairly robust, a little bit like a cow, so it's going to have a little bit more, uh, a little bit more full um, uh, rib cage. I would guess that it probably. And it's also like a bit of like a pig, so. Uh, and we're gonna we're just gonna pretty much go with the same uh, pelvis. And Man, this crowd is getting tough. Now they're what? talking about aardvarks and uh, <laughs> llamas. <I> mean, <laughs> haven't asked for a whale. I can do a whale, but it's a, it's the same structure. Okay, we got a, we got the uh, you know, we got the pelvis. We got an upper leg. We got a lower leg. We got a foot, and then we've got uh, a shoulder blade. But have the upper arm, and I think they probably they have fairly short legs, very bold, robust legs. And I would think that 
their neck is like a cow. A horse can do this. A horse's neck can do this. A cow really can't do that. It's shorter and it's going to really kind of run downhill. So we're going to put, I'm going to put a cow skull on it just because I don't know what a rhino uh, skull looks like. Although I would assume that it's long. It's fairly long and it's probably got a pretty good sized jaw. Maybe not quite that big. All right, let's flesh that baby out and see what we got. I think the ears go this way, like a horse. It's going to be, and I know it's got, I know it has a bit of a hump here, and I think it has a hump on its rump. It goes here. Oh, Paul. I think it goes down like this. And I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty thick through here. And it's, golly, I, I would, again, like a cow, I think it probably goes like this. And, you know, we know that it has, of course, it has a horn here. Okay, now look at your screen. That was a pretty good guess. Oh, yeah, you see that, look, it has, here's one thing it has. It has these spines. They're way up there. Okay, that's good. Almost like a, uh, a buffalo has that. All right, so let's just we'll just kind of flesh that out. We've got we got a muscle goes this way, muscle goes this way, got a muscle coming down the leg, and then we've got muscle coming off of off the rump, which comes around to the lower leg. And we got this one coming to the upper leg. And then we've got, I think this one's too squat. I think probably this needs to be back here. Okay, so we tested you with one you don't know. Okay, we're gonna do a quick test from the comments. We need a cat. A cat. Well, now we get into it. Okay. This is good because this tells me what I don't know. Yeah. I will tell you right now, I don't know a cat. However. Well, would you rather we do an alligator or no, a honey badger? No, no. Let's see if we can do a cat <laughs> based on, on what we know here. Let's say you want to draw a cat. I know that it's going to have more of a curved spine because a cat moves more more it has more agility because of that curved spine than uh uh a cow or a horse uh i don't know what scapula looks like on a on a cat we're going to guess that hey, uh, you, I've got actually, one, you got one cat. minute to do a cat and then we're going to run out of time okay well how much time do we have well we're going to have save room for one more animal but you got one right. minute on a cat all right well then i'm not going to talk i'm just going to do it all right Okay. You guys, they're a tough crowd, man. They're coming up with all kinds of things in the yeah. in the chat. Okay. So what we'll do is we're going to do now something that will make this easy for you. Okay. That looks like a cat. Now let's do a bird. Okay. Let's do a bird. Let's do a check. Okay. Most birds are the same. Again, we're going to start with, with a rib cage and a spine. The spine on a bird comes up at the shoulder here. It's going to go up like so. The uh, the uh, pelvis on a, on a bird is flat. Typically does this. It has a long upper leg. It's a shorter lower leg. And then you've got, like I said, three feet. And the arm on a, on, a, on a chicken, usually a chicken is folded up. You've got upper arm, lower arm, and then you've got the hand. But we're going to put it up as if it's ready to fly. It's going to have an upper arm, lower arm, and a hand. The hand on a chicken, is the fingers are fused, but it does have a thumb. And it does have a humerus and an ulna. And the way that works is if you had a wing. Now, let's, just put a, let's go ahead and put a head on this thing. And that is a bird. And of course, right. there's a key over here. Now, real quick, I can turn this into, we know that chickens, uh, birds are dinosaurs. We're going to take this wing off. Instead of coming, then we're going to come off the shoulder. We're going to have an arm, the upper arm, lower arm. Now we're going to give it claws instead of a wing. And what we end up with is a velociraptor. Well, we've been eating dinosaurs all this time. I we've had no idea. Dinosaurs. All right. 
Okay, we're out of time. You come back on, on hey, camera so bye. we can see you. <laughs> Here I am. Well, this is fun. Our guest today is Lon Brower. Lon, this has been very helpful. Uh, now, every time we see a cow or a pig or a rhinoceros, we're going to be thinking about the rib cage as the starting point. You're going to be thinking about that ladder back chair that's inside that, that animal. So That's yeah. right. So. Well, now now we're going to have to get anatomy books. and uh, It's not and... that far. It really is. It's just you've got to learn it. You've got to learn some things. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, like easy, to, easy to find online. All right. Well, Lon, thank you so much for doing this today. And I want to congratulate you on the new video. And again, tell people that it's out there at uh, painttube.tv. And uh, it's really terrific. It's called Abstract Figure Painting. And he did this from a photo, which is also kind of fun to see how he did that. So uh, that is on video now, and you can find it at painttube.tv. Just search his name, Lon, L-O-N, and you'll find it. Hey, thanks, Eric. This has been great. I've been, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, you know, this yeah. this is so much fun for, for me to see. Every single day, there's, there's something that we all learn. You know, at, in, if you go to a traditional art school, and I'm not dissing that by any stretch, but they have to kind of build things in modules, for the lowest common denominator, because you got 60 people in the class. And this is compressed learning. So this is an opportunity to learn a lot of little tidbits every day. This was a good one. Well, keep in mind that, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we can go to school or not go to school, but we, we have to ultimately learn this stuff on our own. Yeah. And uh, we can pick up tidbits and, and we can put it in the, you know, like I said in the video, it's a casserole in our heads and we just got to keep filling it up. Yeah. So we, we need everybody to do a, do a drawing of an animal with their skeleton and then post it so we can see it. That'd be comment. cool. I'd like to see that. All right, yeah. Lon, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today. All right. You have a great right. day. Okay, yeah. good. Well, thank you for uh, watching Art School Live today. A reminder that we have the plein air convention coming up in May, and that would be a real cool thing for you to attend. Uh, it was sold out pre-COVID. And uh, we think it'll probably be sold out again, but we don't, of course, know. Um, but once we announce our celebrity guest, which could be any day now, uh, that is probably going to be a big thing. Anyway, we hope you'll come. Uh, it's a nice, fun event to get, in, get together in person, paint together. Uh, top instructors like Lon, you know, who are out there working with people. Also, there's instructors on stages and you got watercolor stage and a an oil stage, a lot of different stages. So we hope you'll join us at plenairconvention.com. Thanks for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. A reminder, subscribe to this so that you can get it every single day. Just go to YouTube uh, and look up Art School Live and hit subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.